Good afternoon, everybody. So welcome you all to today's online session, uh, International Perspectives on Social and Behavioral Approach of Business. Today we have speakers from Chittagong, Dubai, and Mumbai joining us. And here from Kolkata, Ms. Noyantara Pal Chauthuri, the chairperson of Socioeconomic Initiative of the Bengal Chamber, is moderating the session. Before we move on to Ms. Pal Chauthuri, I would request my colleague, Ms. Shornali Thor, to please share the take to do's. Ms. Shornali. Thank you, Anguna. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for the ease of listening to the esteemed panelists, we have muted all participants except the speakers. We would request all of you to kindly keep your videos off for better connectivity. Also, if you wish to ask any questions to our esteemed panelists, kindly write your questions in the chat box along with the speaker name who you wish to ask the question to. Thank you very much. Now we would request Ms. Pal Chaudhuri to please say, take the session forward. Thank you, Angora. Reference. None. Um. Just one second. It's okay? Yes, ma'am, you can carry on, yeah. Thank you, Angona. It gives me immense pleasure to once again welcome all our distinguished panelists today from Bangladesh, India, and the UAE. It is indeed wonderful that we could uh, bring together thought leaders from different countries to share their views and experience on how businesses may be more empathetic to society. Well, friends, we are all witnessing an unprecedented time globally. The novel coronavirus has made its footprints in almost every country. However, the response to this pandemic differs from country to country, depending on the impact and, of course, the resources available. Friends, what is important at this point is to develop cooperation and be empathetic. We live in an integrated economy and therefore all stakeholders across the globe and across society are important. And of course, the recent experience with this pandemic has taught us all to be more responsive to society. As the role of business in society continues to evolve, businesses are also rising to the challenging needs of the society. And in the middle of all the challenging times that we are going through, corporate social innovation is also evolving. The Bengal Chamber's newly constituted committee, Socioeconomic Initiative, is to address the societal needs as we strongly believe that a Chamber of Commerce is also a social being. With this objective in mind, today is our inaugural program and we will of course continue to engage with our stakeholders towards this mission. The Chamber has always been proactive and right from the beginning of the outbreak of COVID-19 in India, the Chamber has embarked on disseminating information to members uh, and society at large, including interaction with our internal health experts. In fact, the Chamber has been involved in various service projects during this hour of crisis, from donation of uh, masks to supplying of ration to contractual workers, adopting free markets and offering relief to street food vendors. We do believe that there are various ways business can create social values. Today's session is on how businesses can be more empathetic to society. We are all eagerly waiting to hear from our distinguished panelists. May I now invite Dr. Munal Mahbub, 
Senior Vice President of Chittagong Women's Chamber of Commerce representing Bangladesh to share her thoughts with us. Munal, in your address to us, I would also request you to tell us in what areas do you think mentoring can be provided to entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs? Over to you, Munal. Munal? Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. What a lovely evening it is. Staying positive is the only thing we can do now. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Noyan Tarapal Chaudhary, for your lovely introduction. And I wish you all the best with your new committee and all the great activities you are doing. We Chamber of Commerce are doing similar things uh, to support our community. So I would like to start by expressing my heartiest gratitude to Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry for taking this initiative, and especially Dr. Angona, who always keeps us updated and comes up with all new innovative session. Well, we are all connected virtually now in this pandemic, but I must mention that I'm missing the city of joy, Kolkata, a bit more today. Uh, though our two Bengal is separated by a geographical border, but we share almost all our culture and values as one nation. As a representative of Chikchukong Women Chamber of Commerce Industry, I fear that our advances may be raised as the impact of the coronavirus is felt around the world. As we strive to understand the nature of this pandemic, we are starting to see the significant ways it will impact women and small and medium enterprises globally. I have been hearing from our entrepreneurs and partners that some of the women are struggling to keep their farms afloat and others who are working as fast as they can do to adapt new business models. Their stories are a call to action as we work to find ways that our organization and our partners network can lean in and help women entrepreneurs around the world to get through the crisis. It is increasingly clear that the COVID-19 pandemic is a global crisis, unlike anything we have seen before. From the gender perspective, Previous pandemic had taught us that the crisis is likely to disproportionately impact women and girls as they are generally subjected to more economic and social vulnerable situations. Women are also overrepresented in care and medical sector and, they, and their household are they're more exposed to health related threats. At the same time, small businesses are expected to bear the burnt of the economic downturn. With sales plumping, supply chain disrupted, and many basic operations suspended, the prognosis for SME is dire. But if we see the positive side, our Prime Minister has taken the initiative with lots of government packages along with World Bank, taking important steps to keep the funding taps open in their near terms through guarantees, forbearance, and new funding allocation. But the negative impact is on small business will be both wide and deep, especially the women entrepreneurs. Women-led SMEs are more at risk as they often have smaller business. They operate in service, fashion, and trade sector, typically in lower margin industries that are more susceptible to demand disruption than the average SME. Many women-led enterprises can be found in sectors that directly are hit by social distancing measures, such as tourism, education, childcare, restaurants, and more traditional female professions such as beauty and hair salons. For example, two major festivities of our country like Pohela Boishak and Eid has brought no business to the fashion and garment industry, which eventually has hit hard in our economy and cash flow. It is also well established that women have a harder time getting access to finance and those they do not have sufficient credit history and collateral to maintain the financial they have. Moreover, as families retreat to their homes, women should shoulder the lion's share of the care burden for the elderly, at-risk family members and children. They also face a heightened risk of domestic violence. As a record, you might know that around 14 women has been killed due to domestic violence during this lockdown all around the world. So this makes the mammoth task for running a business during this trying times even more challenging. Even when the worst of the pandemic is over and sense of normal sea returns, women-led business will continue to be affected by the long-term decline in consumer purchasing power and lasting disruption to supply chain and finance. 
The current circumstances may also provide unique opportunities for some SMEs, especially those in the health and online education spaces, as well as technology solution that can address the disruption brought on by COVID-19. For other entrepreneurs, this may be a time of transition of their businesses to move online or otherwise adjust to the new realities. But it is going to be a bit difficult for countries like us, as you know, many small business enterprises are still running in very old fashion. And, uh, and uh, an implementation of this modern technology will be a bit challenging. On the brighter side, we can also see some new scope, scopes in garment industry where they are already getting involved in making masks, surgical gloves, and people, personal protective equipment and hospital products. I would like to share some activities and to-do list uh, Women, Women Chamber is doing in brief and how we are motivating our entrepreneurs both mentally and economically in order to navigate the economic turbulence by partnership and knowledge, now more than ever. As a majority of our entrepreneurs are from SMEs, we're going, uh, we're going to help with uh, government and other business organization so that we can bring in more funds to them and helping them with necessary documentation. As we work to determine where our funding can have the greatest impact and leverage, we are keen to le le learn from the past and from others who are seeking solutions. Some of the key questions we are asking are as follows. Economic impact. How will a woman entrepreneurs will be differently affected by social and economic disruption that occur as the pandemic plays out in different industries and countries? We are trying to building build new capabilities. What are the most effective models for supporting women-led business to move online, operate remotely, and adjust their business model, not just to the immediate crisis, but to build a stronger foundation for future growth? What are the most effective models for delivering training and coaching and mentoring remotely? So as you have asked me that question that what are the training and the models we can do online, like edu Edu educational technique, for example, uh, you know, emphasizing particular topic regarding that uh, matters. If you can, we can, we can take a survey to the woman and we, I'll come up with the things they want and I will let you know. And sustaining financial support. How can financial institu institution be supported to extend lifelines to women entrepreneurs in terms of term adjustment, new funding or guarantees? Leverage emergency program. What needs to be done to ensure that emergency program to support SMEs are making their way to women entrepreneurs who are already marginalized. Marginalized and now balancing business and household needs that are greater than ever. Opportunities to thrive. How to identify and support women who are positioned to lean into the crisis with products and services that will support consumers, other businesses, as they adjust to both the short-term effect, but also the acceleration of long-term trends like digitalization and remote works, health tech, edu tech, that will be brought on by crisis. Policy action. Are the policies that can be put in the place that will help women entrepreneurs manage their business and family needs more effectively, give financial breathing room and reduce constraints, constraints to do business during this time? Where do data gaps need to be filled so that women are not invisible and ignored? These times offer an extraordinary opportunity for all of us to provide support and come together, a bit virtually to emphasize the role and importance of, of women-led business who are at the forefront of serving their community and to mobilize our network of partners so women entrepreneurs get the right tools and services to adapt to this challenging time. I look forward to learning and partnering with others to make a difference. Please share your experience, data and research and innovation related to the impact of the crisis on, on women entrepreneurs in developed countries with our organization so that we can bring all the women entrepreneurs in a common platform where they will get better tech solution, impactful mentoring, and obviously innovative training. With all hopes and fear, I conclude by saying, hang in there, better days will become. Stay home, stay safe. Munal, that was indeed wonderful. Uh, you have covered a lot of grounds, including the role of the government, the role of your chambers of commerce in mentoring 
small businesses and of course women entrepreneurs and women led businesses as you said thank you so much i'm sure there will be a lot of interaction later on i would now go on to our next speaker and request madam indrani malkani she is the chairman and managing trustee v citizens action network she is also an ashoka fellow uh, representing india to address us and share her experience of working and partnering with corporates and the government especially the government of maharashtra over to you madam namaskar namaskar my sincere thanks to bengal chamber of commerce and industries for inviting me today it is indeed a pleasure to be a co-panelist with two other ladies and a moderator also a woman so women power all the way uh representing india it is my privilege uh indeed it is my privilege india is not just a country it is a subcontinent comprising of states which don't speak the same language whose food habits are different very different as a matter of fact different ethnic groups different tribes diverse cultures and in many cases the physical features are completely different as well so now when we touch upon the social and behavioral approach of business in india there are a couple of realities that are unshakable india is a deeply hierarchical society and any behavioral change approach of business in india there are a couple of realities that we need to keep in mind because this change is very complex and the inadequacies and strengths in india need to be highlighted one size does not fit all businesses so there has to be different business modules structured considering the social background the economic background and the state culture in general it is seen that behavioral change of any kind is tough because the human brain adores status quo and is never comfortable with change even if the existing behavior can cause huge negative consequences as can be seen in today's current times changing behavior more so of a large and diverse country like india is even more daunting task there are two points which i would like to highlight and draw your attention to the emergency situation of current times not only in india but globally should transition into positive business outcomes and making responsiveness to the changed social needs vital to business culture it is necessary the second point is it is necessary to bring about an emotional connect of the common citizen with the government the primary change agent the organization i helm is in the social sector which works very closely with the corporate sector in certain ways and with the citizenry in a networking manner and involvement primary involvement of our organization is citizens engagement with the government it would be first the local government then to the state government and certainly on issues of national interest with the government of india one of the things that we do is conduct interactive talk shows called together we can's social sanchar by its name it's a discussion and an interaction basically we tell the citizens interact with your government from wherever you are so that is the pivot on principle on which we work on the biggest barrier to what i have seen in uh, social behavioral change in india is that the common citizen does not have an emotional connect 
with the government, the primary change agent, as I mentioned. Here, our comes role, comes our role, sorry, wherein we bring in a diverse group of citizens, that is the consumers and the citizens, two sides of coin, and the government, the policymakers, because ultimately business depends on the policy of the government of the day. So that is the dire necessity in India, as we can identify working in the social sector. The opening up of various sectors to the PPP model, when our government, the Indian government, has proclaimed of a self-reliant India, can only be achieved by a closer liaison and understanding between the two prime movers, that is the citizens and consumers, and the government. And this leads to the issue of demand, local demand and supply. To bring about business success, the supply side will have to listen very closely to the new demands. This in turn will lead to new business opportunities and successes in existing ones. The social conditions excuse me, I think uh, the click of a button, technology is always challenging. The social conditions and behavior will now drive the demand. Of course, the bottom line costs will also have to be a prime consideration where business are concerned. We keep hearing about technology being used and in, you know, uh, continuously. In fact, today we are on a digital platform, no doubt the use of technology will be the way forward. However, technology itself will have to reinvent, keeping the need of the common consumer in focus. And that is crucial. Companies will have to look not only just at monies, but collateral benefits as well. In a general context, a point to highlight when it comes to social responsiveness, does networking work in business in the current scenario? I believe it does. And now in the changed world of buyers and sellers, the two industries which comes to mind are hospitality and tourism. These two sectors have always worked very supportively and been complementary to each one's business success to quite some extent. These two businesses or rather industries have always had their primary focus on customer satisfaction. Hence, all their staff and employees integrated the, as the aspect of responsiveness or empathy into their DNA. This is the change needed in all business entities. The HR teams will have to incorporate current requirements towards social responsiveness uh, into the company culture. Another example of the employees uh, issue is the health sector. The focus of companies and businesses, uh, business houses thus far, have been to take care of, of their employees, related to their employees, is the major elements of physical injuries, etc. But with COVID-19, a highly infectious disease which has marked its presence in nearly all the countries of the world, people across the globe are facing the same challenges, irrespective of their socio-economic background, race, creed, geographical location, young and old, etc., and looking to solutions to overcome the challenge. Such a phenomena has not been witnessed in recent memory, as my previous speaker also had touched upon. In this COVID-affected environment, the highlight that has emerged is that people have become conscious of their health and well-being like never before. Here is the shift that the HR teams have to consider. The employees' own and their families' physical, mental, and emotional well-being has to become the primary focus. A clear-cut business opportunity has also emerged in this scenario the primary healthcare sector, which is the actual foundation of the healthcare system in any country. In India, 
quite sadly, this sector has been largely ne neglected. Though I do understand the, uh, the Bengal Chamber, your healthcare sector is very strong and we look forward to collaborating on that sector going forward. The other area which uh, in my previous discussions we had talked about is the area of transport and where social distancing will become a challenge hugely. Now, when we talk about mass mobility in mega cities like Mumbai, physical distancing is paramount under the current circumstances, but is a huge challenge because many things will have to be factored in. The focus thus far has been on mass rapid transport. The sheer numbers in mega cities as Mumbai are under normal circumstances extremely challenging to implement. And now with physical uh, distancing becoming the norm and the requirement actually for, for our own health, what will emerge is from this emergency to transit to clean transport modes for mass mobility. In order to achieve it from the business point of view, a balanced approach and view is required as well. We have to look at alternate modes of transport and mobility which can address the issue of physical distancing. Uh, let me give you an example. If you take a bus which either transports school children or even the general public, as per the current Motor Vehicles Act, the seats are all together. Now that is something which cannot remain any longer. The moment the whole transport sector opens up, that is the first thing that will have to be considered. So therefore, the policy has to change to accommodate seats being made with a space in between. You cannot have standing in buses. The same will apply to local trains or the suburban railways particularly where Mumbai scenario is concerned because Mumbai's lifeline, the entire city is dependent on railway transport, the local railway transport. So you will need to have, we will need to have, I should say, uh, the policy addressing the change in the hardware, the change in the fare structure, the change in people's behavior to accept this change. So there are two factors. The administration will have to be very strong to implement it, first create the policy and then to implement it, and the general public to accept that this is the current requirement and that is for our own good. So this will enable the transition that we are looking at. I was reading uh, a short while ago of UNDP uh, raising a point of women's participation in the labor force. Now in India, we have seen, as I had mentioned earlier on in my uh, opening statement, that our hierarchical society has got all the layers by way of work and by way of business opportunities and employment. We have seen women working in the agricultural sector, and I'm talking about the labor force in particular, in the construction sector, and most successful model of both of these as well as of the uh, particularly the agricultural sector is the Amul Milk Cooperative Movement, the milk production center uh, sector, where you have a full cooperative movement coming into place with the farmers and force equally shoulder to shoulder working. And it's one of the most successful models um, recognized globally, very productive, very uh, business um, uh, savvy, and a lot of learnings can be had from this model going forward. Most entrepreneurs who will have to now identify the local needs, the local cultures, and then merge it with the latest technologies to develop, uh, to deliver. There will be less traditional business as we know it now. The other point that has come about in today's scenario, which we have 
noticed is the urban and rural link for business. The middleman has now been summarily cut off. So the new mantra is direct to home in the new business and that's the new way of life in India. No doubt many emergency checks and balances will have to be identified and this will have to become the focus of business going forward. Uh, the reason I talked about entrepreneurs, because as an Ashoka fellow, we are all called social entrepreneurs. Some of us work in the not-for-profit sector where I do, but then there are many of my uh, cohorts who are in the for-profit. So either way, we will have to look at business today more in the terms of how an entrepreneur looks at it, because that's how we will be able to integrate the various challenges that come from the social sector. Let me touch upon a small point which I thought of sharing is the role of a chamber of commerce in this scenario. The chamber could, a suggestion from me, uh, a chamber could set up a behavioral push unit for its member companies. It will develop behavioral strategies and will complement other policy decisions. Will this nudge be a success in India? Well, we'll have to try it first. But I do believe firmly good relationship and business continuity strategies are the keys going forward where business is concerned. And certainly a partnership, a working in the spirit of partnership with the citizens and consumers, with the government of the day, with the corporate support is the way to go forward. So joining hands, working together, understanding each other's needs is where I see us going in time to come. Thank you for giving me this opportunity of sharing my thoughts. Thank you, madam. Can you hear? Thank you, madam, for your very valuable tips that you've given us including the Chambers of Commerce, your suggestions on, uh, to the HR teams, and also how we in business can emotionally connect more and more with the government, whether local, state, or the central government. And of course, your valuable tips on social responsiveness. Thank you. I'm sure we'll have a lot of interaction later on. I would now go straight on to our last speaker, Spandana Palepu. She is the founder and CEO of Zo Easy Solutions, representing UAE. Spandana, in your address, I would like you to share how we can create a balance between using technology, as mentioned by Madam Alkani earlier, for social distancing and employability. Over to you, Spandana. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, hello, everyone. Lovely to see all of you on this wonderful webinar and panel hosted by the Bengal Chamber. Um, I'm Spandana. I'm the founder and CEO of Zoezy, which is a platform that looks at educating and matching the blue collar community to the right employment opportunities using ethical and transparent hiring processes. So we focus on sustainable job creation at fair wages and the, essentially the idea is to remove the network of middlemen and create a direct connection between employers and job seekers using technology and transparent hiring processes. Um, with regards to the question that Ms. Nayantara has posed towards me, um, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that in the last few months, you know, the new normal has completely changed. The new normal is all about having to rely on 21st century technologies, be it uh, simple solutions like Zoom, which is allowing us all to be able to connect from different parts of the world. I mean, I noticed that there's over 140 participants on this one Zoom call. And in reality, it would take so much coordination and effort to be able to, you know, organize such an event. But, you know, technology is now bridging that gap and is allowing us to connect from different parts of the world. 
Um, so I see that like a reliance on different technologies such as artificial intelligence, the internet of things, social media, digital learning platforms, and even, you know, a, a few fan versions like virtual reality are really uh, shaping a lot of innovation in the current day. Um, so in terms of the employability aspect of things, the way I see um, technology can help us or is changing the way things are working are in three main areas. Uh, the first being recruitment selection and onboarding. The second being a shift towards a more flexible form of working, essentially being remote working. And three, the acceleration of the fourth industrial revolution and the rise of AI, I would say, but you know, that's, that's not a term that we need to be scared of in any way. Um, so in terms of recruitment selection and onboarding, what uh, we have noticed as a company is when we started our, uh, when we started our firm, um, many people you know, found that the platform was a little too futuristic because we started talking about things like pre-recorded interviews, online assessments, um, being able to live interview from far away without having to travel somewhere and meet job seekers in person. And similarly, job seekers were also a little intrigued by this whole idea of how, how will someone be able to tell what my skills are through an online platform. But, you know, with the pandemic coming in, now everything has changed. Employers are having to adapt to new, more innovative technologies to be able to meet their hiring needs and to be able to meet future hiring needs as well. And so in the process, you're, you will have to rely on things like live interviewing on platforms like Zoom, like on platforms like Slack to be able to coordinate with people from different parts of the world. And you know, considering we focus on the blue collar community, many people ask me this one question. So how will you access this mass population that isn't really as connected to the internet or mobile data? When in reality, what many people don't realize is majority of the population actually has access to a smartphone. Almost 40% of the world is connected to mobile data. 3.5 billion people are online. So it's time to start leveraging that and it's time to start moving towards that because it'll just make things easier. You have so many ways of displaying your skills without actually having to, you know, go there in person and show this person and convince them that, you know, you're able to do that specific task. You can use video to be able to show your welding skills or your cooking skills even. Um, and what, what we've come to realize is that many employers actually enjoy pre-recorded interviews. So they set a five, say five main questions that they would like to see empl employees talk about. And when we post this to job seekers that were uh, applying to these positions, we noticed that many of these job seekers, especially in the blue collar community, were able to better communicate their skills and their knowledge as opposed to a standard written CV that you were to send by email or by a post. Um, so what I feel is that, you know, in that sense, it's been a blessing in disguise in helping shape different technologies and bringing out the innovation among people, especially in the employment sector, because, um, you know, people from more vulnerable communities who may not have access to so many employment opportunities, you're suddenly bridging a lot of gaps for them and exposing them to so many positions, not even, not just in their local economy, but from across the globe. And you allow them to dream big and move towards a better standard of living. So recruitment and selection wise, yes, it is definitely uh, changing the way it works. And I have a feeling that this is going to go for the long term. It's not a short term thing. This will be set in stone for generations to come. And I'm really glad to see that it's moving in that direction and bringing the transparency that it needs. Um, the second area that I see that, um, that technology will play a role is the ability to work remotely with more flexibility. And this ties in with the points that Ms. Indrani was making and Dr. Munal was making in terms of bringing women into the workforce. Because when you add more flexibility to the, to the working system, 
women will be able to come forward and be able to contribute more productively in this in the community and in the workforce and i feel like that's that aspect is very important because you know the standard nine to five method of working doesn't it's it's going out the window now <laughs> it's not it's not going to be there anymore it's all about bringing in the trust and ensuring that you know as long as productivity levels are high enough um we can head in the right direction and deliver the inputs that we need to um and this is something that i've noticed uh, not only in the last few days but it's a generational thing i feel being a millennial as well many many millennials work in that manner so we're we're not like the nine to five type of people we work eight hours those eight hours can come at any time it can be from midnight to eight in the morning or it can be during the day but as long as the work is delivered and the output is is there that's all you need you just need to keep the cogs moving <laughs> so um definitely i feel like um you know this new method of working will actually create more of that culture and will allow for people to actually become more productive as well because you're now giving them the chance to have that work life balance and that's what i've noticed like with with the pandemic happening you know people are actually connecting a lot more i feel because um i remember prior to this you know we wouldn't be on zoom calls we wouldn't be reaching out to people in different parts of the world we would try to have meetings for everything <laughs> um but now i feel like productivity has gone up so much more because you don't have to commute to work you your workstation is literally get out of bed shower come downstairs to your office room and that's it you're ready to go and um in the process you can also connect with different team members by zoom you call you go through all your tasks for the day and you're you know you're ready to go productivity up there <laughs> so um i really feel like um it is going to this is, it is going to shape the way things work in the future in that sense um and also i feel like it's a more sustainable form of working as well because um also you don't need to no co2 emissions or anything like that you know <laughs> you just have to open your laptop to work so i think uh it also creates a more sustainable form of working with greater productivity and uh the final area that i think that um this is going to play a big role where technology is going to play a big role is actually accelerating the fourth industrial revolution um now when I talk about the fourth industrial revolution or the rise of AI. I notice that sometimes a few people can get a little skeptical because um you know there is this fear that AI can replace certain jobs in the future. The fourth industrial revolution will replace jobs in the blue collar community when in reality I just think that you know it will be more of a shift in in skills. So it's about adaptability. and it's about getting people to move towards the those future skills and uh one of the initiatives that we've been working on recently considering the whole situation was actually addressing sectors like hospitality and travel and aviation which have been the biggest hits uh like Dr. Munal and Ms. Indrani have rightly said and um Unfortunately many people have either gone on unpaid leave or they are uh, or they are working at the moment but their work hours have reduced because there simply isn't enough business and so um the government has definitely eased its restrictions and has created a little more flexibility for job seekers to be able to um you know diversify their skill set and move into other areas that they could they think they could find better employment opportunities So one initiative that we are currently working on is uh with a major NGO in the region called uh Education for Employment. Um and this is with the support of Accenture who have this beautiful learning management system uh where they deliver online training sessions in relation to the skills of the future which are essentially communication, creativity and innovation. client focus um being able to set goals and to be able to achieve them and working in a more structured and methodical manner um and so what we have now been doing is we have been reaching out to the people in our existing database so we have a database of about 65,000 job seekers from different uh from different sectors and of different age groups and of different um different nationalities and gender as well 
Um, so we've been reaching out to job seekers within our existing database and we've been reaching out to job seekers through social media platforms and to companies as well to be able to get the, this training program out to these people so that now you have time on your hands and it is the perfect moment to make use of that and create that constant uh, culture of learning so that you can diversify your skill set and so in the future, you'll be able to not only get access to better employment opportunities, but you'll also be able to, to move into other areas with more ease, as opposed to being only in one sector. It'll also allow you to move up the ranks as well and hit supervisory positions or positions that you feel would be able to contribute to a better standard of living. And this kind of has a multiplier effect as well, because it's not just the person that we're focusing on, by being able to improve the standard of living for one person, you're technically having an impact on five other people in their family because this person will then be able to better contribute to their standard of living, contribute to their education, send their kids to school, and you know, creating a better future for their generations to come. And so I feel like with the pandemic coming, Technology has evolved, and because there's more innovation of technology coming through, you now have people moving towards that constant culture of learning and moving into better employment opportunities and in the process, creating greater economic empowerment and reducing inequalities among people. And this is not only in terms of, uh, you know, the, the work sectors. I mean, like, you, like I said, I see more women coming into the, into the workforce. The people that are registered for our training program, more than 45% of them are women, which was amazing for me to see because, you know, it's, you're not, you're not restricting it to anybody anymore. You've broken that barrier. You've broken the glass ceiling. So it brings me so much joy to see that there are so many different people from so many diverse backgrounds trying to enhance their skill set and move in that direction. And, you know, like I've, I've definitely heard that, you know, the blue collar community is one that has been impacted by the pandemic, but there is always an opportunity. There is always another door open and there's always another light shining. And I have seen that though hospitality has been impacted and aviation have been impacted, they have the opportunity to upskill and move in other directions. And then you've seen a rise in business in areas like logistics and healthcare in so many other areas and they form the basis of our economy without them we can't function and so it's also led to a point where you're creating an opportunity and you're also helping save the jobs of these people and helping them contribute more to society as well and so i think essentially just to sum it up these are the three three main areas and i feel like you know Continuing in the same direction, focusing on technological innovation, will be able to create greater diversity, greater economic empowerment, and reduce inequalities in the blue collar community. Thank you, Spandana. A very interesting perspective. Uh, you've shared with us new methods of working, new methods of running our businesses, and how we women entrepreneurs can benefit from all of this. And of course, your very interesting project on education for employment. Friends, I think we will go into a small interaction between the panelists. So may I now request Madam Indrani Malkani and Spandana to interact. And of course, Dr. Munal can join in. We have about five or seven minutes, maybe a question each or any clarification or any thoughts. Over to you, Madam Malkani. Well, um, I was very interestingly hearing about the use of technology, but in the Indian context, Pandana, how do you see with the challenges that we have in India, uh, considering that the, the diversity of who may or may not have access to the hardware, you know, the, the internet and the knowledge and with the language factor, there are so many angles. How do you see uh, technology being used? Also, the balance between use of technology without losing the human touch. Where, because when we talk about responsiveness and empathy, we cannot cut out 
the, the human touch. So how do you see this balance coming in? Absolutely. I completely agree that you cannot cut out the human touch. And that's precisely why I'm working with the blue collar community, because without them, the economy will collapse. And it is not possible 100% for technology to replace that human touch or that human interaction. Um, in terms of the diversity uh, that, that is there in India, I completely agree. There are so many different types of people in different areas. Some have access to connectivity. Some don't have access to connectivity. So I feel like it's really important to combine technology with partnerships because those partnerships will then help drive that impact in those areas that we can't reach through technology. So um, just to give an example, we tied up with the government of Andhra Pradesh um, who have won a body called OMCAP and also the, the skilled, their skill development department which reaches into even rural areas where they've set up training centers to be able to give people training in relation to hospitality, in relation to construction, ITI services, etc. So what, um, what we wanted to do is one, try to bring in that element of tech by training the trainers to be able to impart that knowledge to their, their uh, students. Um, and another thing that we were looking at was actually tying up with the likes of the International Labor Organization and other international training bodies where, where we'll be able to get this material and then impart that to these job seekers and these young people who can absorb that knowledge and try to find better forms of employment. And post-training, what we would then do is take that data, collect that data, put it into our platform, and then start matching that with the jobs that we, that we had. And essentially, the idea was, it was almost like a skills mapping that we were doing. So people that come from this sector, they'll be able to work in this area, and they'll be able to find women not only abroad, but also find employment within the country as well, because it, you know, it's all about boosting the local economy as well. If you don't boost your local economy, why, what's the point really? So, um, so I feel like it's really important to uh, combine both technology and uh, the right skill development partnerships to then be able to put those together and create better opportunities for not only youth, but people and women from underprivileged backgrounds in general, I feel. So I, I really hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. I think Dr. Munal has a question or two for Spandana as well. Dr. Munal? No, actually, uh, Ms. Uh, Ma Malkini has already mentioned my okay, okay. class. It's Thank the same query. issues we yeah. are actually worried about. Right, right, right. So, Angona, we can go straight on to the audience uh, questions. And uh, I think we have time for three or four questions. Over to you, Angona. Abunal, I know you will have to leave soon. You are half an hour ahead of us and you have your fast breaking. So just quick one question to you. Uh, what do you think the current trend uh, in Bangladesh moving towards industry orientation among women? Is it like uh, only in the services sector or women are also participating in uh, you know, uh, industry sectors like steel, mining, and, you know, things like that. Thank you. Well, you, I'm example. I'm in commodity sector, food and grain sector, and I'm, I'm also in hospitality sector. So women are not limited to only, like, uh, hair, beauty parlor, service sector. Women in Bangladesh are into ready-made garment industry. Women are into hospitality sector. They own uh, health sector. They are into computer tech system. They are, they are in everywhere. And I think one of the increase of GDP of Bangladesh is because of the involvement of women into the industry. 50% of population of any, of any country is women. So if you don't involve that 50%, then your GDP will never be counted. And our our prime minister being a woman, she's empowering a lot, uh, a lot. I mean, you can't imagine that, like beforehand, we, the women, when they used to go for a loan in a bank, they used to have collateral uh, or, you know, they have to use guarantor as a, or your husband or your father. And which was a bit difficult because uh, convincing your husband and convincing your father is was different. But now we, the, go, the banks are giving loan of at least five to 10 lakhs without any collateral engagement. 
so in that way more people more women are coming into this into investing and another is we have done a lot of online uh, based business which is more for women women are into online based business like for example nowadays people are going less into the market rather shopping especially the women are shopping more from the house like that like miss malkani said delivery to home now this concept has been in our uh, culture for like one or two year back and for this pandemic it has now boomed up so and in that sector women are totally engaged so i think women women are not uh, you know conventional way they are not in those sectors any any time now so we are in all sectors in bangladesh thank you mulal great to hear from you and thanks for sharing a very holistic orientation i'll move on to ms malkani uh, how do you see the challenges of digital application in cross section of society yes as um, I, i i always felt that since we also use technology a great deal to bring about this uh, partnership or connect with the government and the citizens what we do notice is that various sections of society are not able to use the digital interface so today if we have in the government online services for that matter even the judiciary in the judicial process also digital technology use of digital uh, modes that is technology for enhancing is acceptable is workable but when when it comes to uh, various uh, you know economic sections then comes the question of uniform interact interconnectivity of the uh, internet for example because if you don't have the basic premise the foundation of using uh, technology that is the digital interface then there is a channel challenge because one hand you're giving one part of the services but if the use of the services is a challenge then that has to be addressed so these are also business opportunities is from the private sector as i as i mentioned that the today our government in india is saying that self reliant india so therefore the robust use of technology but with a focus on the user that will enable the business to move ahead and that also brings us to those people who are physically challenged so uh, pwds so then their usage of digital means would be somewhat different to the ones who are able bodied so all of these factors will need to come in so when we are addressing the digital leap forward and digital technology being used there are likely to be issues which needs to be addressed so therefore using technology is the way forward but reinventing the usage of technology in the circumstances that are required is also uh, very much required so entrepreneurs need to look at how they reinvent the technology for the end user because if the user is not able to use it the entrepreneur doesn't make any money if your platform is not being used optimally you don't make the money so that has to be so ultimately it is the human beings who are using it so that human angle when we talked about responsiveness that is where we need to look at yeah. uh, it, the same thing will happen with uh, healthcare today uh, tele you know i mean uh, google everybody goes to google to find out about a common ailment you're likely to land up with uh, more uh, you know uh, missed diagnosis then uh, you would be uh, wanting so therefore certain technology must be fitted in to 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 address the common requirements of everyday life and then those then the complicated ones which goes into what uh, spandana was uh, mentioning uh, into the business aspect of it so technology and the digital platform also will have to be put in certain silos and sectors and they have to also interact and understand the user demand then it will work 
it will work better, I should say, and it will be more business productive from that point of view. Thank you, Ms. Malkani. Uh, so I believe digital... Uh, Inclusiveness is the next thing which we'll have to focus on. And of course, with that, the appropriate use of technology. So with this, I'll move on to Spandana. Spandana, one of the questions for you, which was posted on the chat, I have kind of uh, made it in kind of my way. That is, how do you think a balance may be struck by creating more entrepreneurs and having more people available for, for being engaged as employees, given the current scenario? Absolutely. Um, so that's a great question, actually. And it reminds me of an initiative that uh, someone's actually launched in the UAE at the moment. Um, so what she's done is actually she's reached out to the blue collar community um, and she has found a few people who also have that entrepreneurial mindset, but don't really have access to the resources to be able to shape their business and grow it into a scalable model. So, um, and these, and some of these ideas that she told me about were amazing. So there were, there was this lady who currently works as a housekeeper, but she wants to create an initiative around financial inclusion through uh, remittances between the Philippines and the UAE. And I mean, that, that, now that's thinking big. And so um, what we have started to do is now collaborate with them through um, what we call the Global Shapers Community which is um, a community under the World Economic Forum, where they bring on young leaders to be able to drive social change and dialogue in the community. So what we've now started exploring is, you know, identifying more people like this and trying to create material for them in relation to different aspects of successfully running uh, a business. And this looks at um, communication, creating pitch decks, um, market research, because market research is the most important thing. For, um, and, uh, you know, essentially putting all these pieces together. And, you know, absolutely, I completely agree. If you can, you know, loop everything together and create that full circle where, you know, you can upskill them to eventually let them start their own businesses and then let them hire more people to come on board and they become trainees, you're creating a, a beautiful ecosystem where, you know, you're, uh, you're empowering them, not only financially, but you're empowering them through creativity, through innovation, and to be able to grow and scale their business to new heights. And so, I mean, the, the moment I heard that question, that was the first initiative that came to my head because, you know, this is what this person I know is doing. She's identifying people and we're trying to map the skills that they have and the skills that they need to improve on and bringing in experts to be able to, you know, help address those issues and help them scale. Right. I'm going to... So thank you, everybody. It's a great pleasure having you all, our speakers, uh, and also the participants. And apart from it is a very interesting topic for us, and I believe for you also. And it was really interesting to organize, coincidentally, uh, all women's panel. So the cast and crew of this program are all women. So thank you, everybody, again. So this, the video of this program will be available in our Facebook page and also will be available in our YouTube within uh, to, by tomorrow uh, day after. So see you all for our next program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Bye. -bye. Bye.